You are watching the Fayetteville Government Channel. Up next, full coverage of the latest City of Fayetteville ward meeting. Ward meetings are held at various times by City Council members to interact with and receive feedback from the residents of their ward. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I think we'll bring Ward 4 and friends to session. Thank you for coming. And first thing we like to do is, is introductions. So we'll go around and I think we'll start over here with JP. Oh, JP. <laughs> <laughs> JP Peters uh, from Cloud Creek Edition. Thank you. And then Archie. Archie Schaefer. 1404 West Cleveland. Beverly Shaker. Maurice Rankin. Bill Muller. Beth Presley. Todd Walters. Mike Emery, I live over on Harvard. Thank you. Uh, Lee Folson, Sustainability and Strategic Planning with the City of Fayetteville. And Terry Gully, I'm the Transportation Services Director for the City of Fayetteville. And Mark Perryman, Facebook PD. Thank you, Mike. All right. And I'm Sarah Lewis. I'm I'm Ward 4 Position 2 City Council Member. And I'm Rhonda Adams, Ward 4 Position 1. It's a pleasure to see you all tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. So I'm I'll review our agenda and then just generally our format so that we can stay on topic. Uh, well, we've done introductions. We're gonna discuss the sidewalk and street overlay progress so far, and there's uh, a lot of good work going on in Ward 4. We're also then here about an upcoming neighborhood plan that's being proposed for for Weddington Corridor, and then, then um, neighborhood questions and topics, and then council topics that are coming up, and then close and then final comments. Okay. Oh, as far as format, what, try to stick to the agenda. Um, raise your hand if you have a comment or question, just to keep us um, organized, and I'll try to help us stay on our time. And if, um, and then if you can frame your ideas as. as in a positive light, providing solutions, ideas, this helps um, move us forward as well. So, all right. Well, Terry Goley is going to talk to us about, <laughs> about the overlay progress. Thank you for coming. And as Terry passes that out, I'll just say that I am, uh, city council members are assigned to committees by the mayor, and I'm on the street committee. And um, Terry, Thank you for your response to Ward 4 issues. You've been fabulous about responding to things that I've brought forward and certainly appreciate you very much. Well, this is just a list. This is, as Rhonda said, we take this list, and this is just the Ward 4 list to uh, the street committee ever 1st of December. And uh, the two I went through and highlighted are the only two we have not already completed for this year in Ward 4. And the bottom one, Venus, we're milling on probably Wednesday or Thursday and we'll be paving it next week. The Valley View, the only reason it's on hold, it would have already been done except we're having issues with our paver, not wanting to climb a hill very good and it's kind of steep. <laughs> so uh, we're going to get that fixed before we go there. Um, because we had issues with it when we paved Sunset last week. But uh, this just kind of gives you a, a rundown of which streets were in that area. The Apatite, uh, that's off of Salem out in Crystal Springs subdivision. Crystal Drive is there. Um, Gypsum also, pretty much anything. Pyrite, Quartz, Rutal, those are all out in that subdivision. But, uh, we did Rufel Road a couple of weeks ago. The the old part, it was falling apart, so we didn't feel like we could wait. You know that road it will later be in the third phase of the bond issue to hopefully bring up the other side equal to the northbound lanes on the east side right now. But uh, you know this is moving along pretty good. We're not paving this way because it's kind of tough. Believe it or not, when the pavement rolls out of the back of the paver at 315 degrees, it's a little rough out there in a 105 degree day. Plus, uh, one of the biggest problems we have with it is we have to get it down to about 150 degrees to do the final rolling to get it firm, and we can't hardly get it to that's hard enough learned, enough that we can do it. That's like the first thing I learned on the city council is there's a paving season. <laughs> well, normally it's summer, but <laughs> it, so. it sounds like it's extreme. <laughs> it's very extreme. Last two have not been fun. I got kind of small with the four or five before that, which were abnormally cool. Oh, they These are 
some I remember in the 80s. Um, sidewalks, um, we've done several in Ford 4. Uh, we've done 15th Street, which is down the south side of the baseball stadium. We did that right before baseball season. We did uh, Razorback Road from Cleveland to Maple, and then repaved a stretch of that also. Um, the Salem Road sections, those are kind of to, to fit in some uh, areas out there that are not connected just south of the school. And then um, we've also got uh, Center Street on our plan for this year. We may or may not be able to get to that this year because that was going to be funded by ORT money that come from a new Freedom Grant with uh, Ozark Regional Transit. We put that on there, but we put more on there so that we would have it covered through the amount of money we had. And we're probably going to be out of money before we get to Center Street. So we'll we'll look at putting it on in a future year through just our regular CIP and sales tax funding. But uh, those are the ones that are in Ward 4 this year. Uh, we'll formulate the new plan uh, and present that in December. We'll be starting to formulate that in November. So if you have particular ones or streets or sidewalks that you feel like uh, deserve our attention and we haven't found yet, feel free to contact us. That's kind of an overview of where we are on that. How do you decide? How, what are the uh, we go out and visually look at them. I mean, we're looking for things like uh, we call it alligatoring, where it'll start breaking down into smaller pieces and kind of look like an alligator skin. And you know, that's right before usually a severe failure because the water's able to penetrate through there and get into the subsurface. Once we lose the subsurface, then we're gonna develop a pothole or else uh, the subsurface will get soft enough that it will sink and we'll actually see it where it'll undulate and pop it up. Um, same with sidewalks, a lot of that is uh, request driven. We're also looking at what's in pro close proximity to schools, what causes uh, maybe two, like a few years ago we did, probably four or five years ago now we did, where we had uh, Greg Street from Township to North Street. It's like 7,000 feet. We had like 5,800 foot of sidewalk there, but we were missing 100 here, 200 here, 300 there. And we went through and did all the sections and then we had essentially created a 7,000 foot sidewalk. Um, we look for connectivity type things. Um, we've hit the schools pretty hard. We're currently, we're wrapping up the Mission sidewalk on the north side of Mission, east of Vanderbilt elementary going out to Covington subdivision and we're we'll probably be finishing up finishing that that completely by next week and then we're looking to move to uh, Mountain Street or Center Street one going uh, Street we'll meet comes up tomorrow night okay good so on which one of those we go but the idea is to connect Mountain the section of college that was skipped where the mountain Inn used to be and then back up Center Street to where we did half a block already when we did the square. So uh, that's going to be our finishing up the mission and doing that as the next project. We just completed the sidewalk around the Chancellor Hotel. We got a cost share with from them with that. So we moved it up to get the money. <coughs> Money out of them to help us build that sidewalk that we would have had to pay 100% for it later if we hadn't have done it at this time. So, um, other major thing, I mean, my division, I'll throw a little more in there, is um, Meadow Valley Trail, which connects the Gold Creek Trail across the University Farm over to Porter Road. We've uh, completed the bulk of that last week, about 99%. We're going back through now looking for other things. We're going to have a final walkthrough on that. Wednesday morning, do anything else we need to do, and then on August 8th, 5.30 at Agra Park, we're going to have essentially a ribbon cutting celebration yeah. of and grand opening of that trail. That's a big deal for Ward 4. So. Yeah. Is the gate down yet at the end? No, what we did, the gate's going to be there. Oh, it is. Uh, but what we did was kind of make a walk around it okay. a little. 
there's a walkway around it to get the port. And if you ask why are we not connecting to the uh, bicycle lanes and sidewalks on the other side of the interstate? Well, we've been working on that for two years. We've had a request in and we're in our sixth of middle with the highway department trying to satisfy everything they want to make that connection. So um, we thought when we started that two years ago, we would have that okay and have that permit in hand by the time we got the trail finished. Well, it hadn't happened. So that's why you kind of dump out on the Porter there and you're kind of on your own to you get over to the bike lanes or the sidewalks on the north side of 540. As quick as we get that permit, we'll go back. We're going, in the meantime, we're getting ready <coughs> to connect uh, our last remaining part of the south side of Lake Fedville, which will give us a paved route all the way around Lake Fedville. So, uh, so can state <coughs> representatives help with that at all? Or is there a uh, I think communicate we're shaking the bushes about as hard as we can. It's just a matter of getting everything through. Plus, I think with them doing the widening and you know yeah. the idea that it would go further is I think they're kind of waiting to see will that pass to get that funding oh, okay and uh, and if so how would they what would they need to do that and how that because they don't really want us affecting something I think that they would then because if, if we put it in they tear it out they have to put it back yeah okay well it's a very pretty trail and we've already ridden on it some but I'm glad to know that you can get around that gate because we saw several yeah. people including us you know carry our bikes no, over that tall gate little, and, you know a five foot walk right. around we just don't want to be vehicular traffic yeah. well it really makes it possible for us now to leave the, the the ward come in and out of the ward through that way and use the restaurants on the west of 540 check and i did that recently and it's just a wonderful start and i know every time jp and i talk like, we need more we need more but it's a great uh, it's like a huge improvement yeah. yeah. to get us connected where we can actually ride out into the ihop and have yeah. breakfast and it, it's a great way to yeah. see agricultural systems i don't know if you've been through there but mm -hmm. you can see the whole agri area it's really pretty yeah, you can ride by cotton, cotton growing cotton. Yeah, and the horses. It's just beautiful. It's really neat. Yeah. Really hear it. Oh, what questions Terry. do you have for Terry? Or us? I, I guess yeah. Terry, the center street, uh, is that? <coughs> Which the street? The center that you're talking about doing the sidewalk there, the mountain end. And the We're talking about doing from the alley behind the bank there, the old right. building, to college. Both so sides. that is that the one where there's the discussion about widening? Yes, and, and that's going to be at street committee tomorrow night. When, and the oh, idea behind okay. that is kind of the two uh, diagram of going down the street. You know, this is the and I'll move in a second and say so the alley's here, and then to go down and to actually bump that out and then come back in parking like that. And do some other bump outs. I'm out of my reaching range. <laughs> but, uh, Cheers, don't let you hop up and down. No. Maybe it'll be some bump outs like that, the same thing, maybe different, you know, than maybe on the other side and of the street. This is center? This is center. Okay. So on both sides, really? Um, yeah, there's some on both sides. Okay. There's a little more on the south side, more on the restaurant side. There is another, but there is some on the others. And I think it's a, there's 24 parking spots there now. It would be 17 if this is chosen to do and this was brought forward because some you know several of the people signed a petition requesting to be looked at so it's going to be taken to street committee tomorrow night and then they'll make a decision if they decide not to do that and just put it straight through like the rest of the street we'll probably start on center next week trying to beat because we can do this side on the south side prior to the students all getting back and be out of the restaurant's doorways yeah. that quick. And then if, uh, if it's decided to do this way, it's going to take a little more effort. So we'll probably go ahead and do mountain and work our way around and try and just work that in when it settles down after school starts. Maybe later in the semester, work around Thanksgiving, things like that. Terry, what, what's the advantage of doing something like that. Is that I think it's just the 
It's the adjacent property owners look at that. I think they've seen the success that Block Street's had on having the Block Street party and things like that on having the ability to get more room for people to be down there if they do some outdoorsy type event there. You know, same thing with the square, because when we widen, widen the sidewalks on the inner part of the square, we did that about three and a half feet wider than they were originally. It's like a whole different place compared to what it used to be. It seems much bigger. It handles a lot more people. So I think they just want to look at that knowing that we were going to do the renovations anyway and make sure they weren't missing an opportunity to get something like that for themselves mm -hmm. like we did for Block. So mm -hmm. this is actually going to widen. It's what it would do is the bump out would be a wider sidewalk and it would be the width of a car's parking space. So it would be like seven and a half to eight feet, about eight feet. So it would widen the sidewalk and wherever those bump outs were eight feet wider than they are now. So it might be a 14 foot sidewalk in sections and then the rest of it would be the same as it currently is where the curb is in these sections where and then it would still be adjacent parking to those so well may i have something that's uh, maybe terry can address that uh, is by the same alarm i noticed on the council agenda thanks for sending me out for my need to pull it off the city site most of myself too uh, can't have it too many places Anyway, uh, the Santa Barn Campus Crest Code, the building the code apartments, asking for a wider, or give it to the city to give up part of the right of way, the portion of 11th Street uh, is adjacent to that project. Anybody know anything about it? Well, I think where that right of way is now goes right through the middle of their complex. Oh, you did. It said 11th Street. Okay. 11th and 989 South School. Okay, I'm not. I'm the not. Grove. You know. mm -hmm. right, right, but I mean, I don't know. The, the part that they're asking for sounded like they were asking for part of 11th Street. Well, it may be right. Is that? That's what. That's the one by the bus. Is by the bus. Yeah. I mean, the old so. school. Yeah. From, from the city. Yeah. And maybe asking for just the north side of that then. Because I know that I don't think there's any plans to close Levin Street. Or well, no, but they've got it. Most of the time, if you drive through there, half of it's closed all the time because they're machines. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. people parked out there at night, partially in the street. The debris is horrible. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that enough to know yeah, exactly no, what part of it they're asking the, for. The uh, folks that yeah, most care about that project uh, really didn't know it was even going to happen. We didn't publicize it much last year. It just came through. Nobody called me ahead of time like we did the first time it came through. Um, neighbors didn't know about it. The veterans thought that it was defeated forever, and we're not worried about it. Finally, the TV station came out after Memorial Day after they saw what had changed there and interviewed people on that site around it. And they were outraged by it and couldn't understand a lot of things, particularly the build two thing built out to the street so there's nothing out there. And one tree on that side that was preserved has red dirt and now they put some soil on top of the red dirt, but it's still not sort of soil. It can't get to the roots of um, the water for it. Um, and there was machine working partly under the Drip under the tree this afternoon. You know, went by there. So, so you have so on the right. There's the right of way is on. It's on new business on the council coming up. It's and so on Tuesday we have agenda and then the meeting is not until next week. Next week the week after. So tomorrow is the agenda, and then next week is the council. Well, with Terry here, I'd like to bring up one more thing that's related to streets. A bunch of the uh, several of the citizens in University Heights area signed a petition asking for traffic calming to be installed along Oliver between Maple and Cleveland and that has, that was put in Chris Brown's hand the engineering and, and Terry's to look at and we've had some conversations about that and just to tell you in general that the speed tables as I understand it cost six seven thousand dollars a piece there's not a budget or funding for that hasn't been for a long time 
And so we're talking about doing traffic studies or whatever to see. There was a traffic study down there at one point that indicated that it did not warrant traffic calming of that street. But it's been about four years. And so Chris and I have, have uh, and Terry, I think, have had some conversations by email about whether or not we would go forward with the traffic study there. I think, I think it would be a good idea, and I've told Chris that. But again, funding and city has not been installing. How long, Terry? You haven't been oh, putting been speed tables in for four or five years. Several probably. years. And so one thing I've learned about being, since I got on city council is that things take a while to work through, you know, getting through departments and talking through things. And so anybody who's out there, um, who signed that petition it's it's being looked at and we're still considering and thinking and talking about how we might move forward with that if anybody has any thoughts on that please let me know well and i would add that there was a study too done on cleveland and then we had different things recommended so i, I guess for for the record only because we're on we're being videotaped here but cleveland as far as like looking ahead and you're talking about november planning <coughs> i think looking back at cleveland as well um i know that Chris came and presented ideas for traffic calming on Cleveland. Then the research was done, it, it's there, and so we need to be looking at, and around the same time, so we start budget in September, so if that's the case, then we need to be looking at that. And then HOTS, I'm pointing at you because you're talking about the funding. Okay. And then HOTS is another one that I've heard requested pretty often, and then uh, for sidewalk, and then Weddington, which was related to our next agenda item, has been also an issue for for walkability. Mm -hmm. And um, particularly on the south yeah. side of Weddington. Yeah, all through yeah. there, which is um, all the which way like I said, re relates very much to what Leaf is going to talk about here in a moment. But I think that, that those are the three areas that I hear. Of course, then connecting all these trails, these little pieces of trail, I hope can stay at the forefront of minds as we go to budget as we talk about overlays for November and um, there's some areas. Well, most of the overlays, overlays, the sidewalks and the trails are pretty much all CIP. Mm -hmm. So they won't really be too much in discussion. And but as count, the council can look at the, both of those yeah. areas and say, you know, should we move stuff around or yeah. what? Sure. Yes. Um, I, I hate to pile on Terry. I'm very sorry to do this, but uh, not that you haven't heard it before. But um, if if you're going to be looking at that, it would be uh, great if you could could throw Sunset uh, Drive in there. We don't have any traffic calming at all, and I know that um, there has been a lot of discussion um, among the, the neighbors on Cleveland about the petition and and that Oliver did, and I signed the one for Oliver as well, but. Um, we have quite a bit of cut through traffic and mm -hmm. I think um, I fully expect it to be quite a bit more. It will be the only street without traffic calming. Um, um, if, if, for example, apartments are built, you know, then there will be, Sunset will be the only one without any traffic calming at all, um, which will be, uh, you know, a, a route back to Weddington, you know, with a right turn only that is <coughs> probably going to be used quite a bit. But we have a lot of country traffic, and of course, I think it'll probably be worse here while Garland is being torn up and re uh, redone, just because people are looking for another route mm -hmm. to go to campus that if they go around and take the Weddington exit uh, and to avoid Garland, or coming from campus to get to Weddington to avoid Garland, I mean, Sunset is okay. pretty much it. That's a good idea. Good. Can you give us a quick update on Garland? What do you know? What I mean, I know it's a highway. Uh, yeah, that's Chris's project more than mine. Um, I know the last week or so they put in their major water line across Garland there at Dean and Sycamore. That was a 20 point water line. And I think they're on schedule, on schedule for the uh, for all the utility relocation. That's moving along pretty so good. Chris will probably review that with the street committee tomorrow yeah, night. It will. It'll happen after council meeting, so that's usually 5.30, 5.45, 6 o'clock, something like that. So tune in if you want to watch Chris's presentation on that. Are there any final comments or questions for Terry? I have a yes. comment about speed tables <coughs> and <laughs> expenses and so on. But next time you drive up Markham, 
uh, <laughs> take note of the irregularity in the street that's just about even in line with the west side of my property, which is 1511. Uh, something has happened there in the past, and there was some maintenance work done, which left a very natural speed hump. I was going to say that. It wasn't constructed as a speed hump, but it works as one very effectively. And and I, I so don't come in I there. Commend and this, that. I commend this book to you that it, a speed hump does not necessarily have to be a seven thousand dollar special construction item. And Terry, I ask you, don't fix that thing in front of my house because it works. And there are a lot of problems with traffic calming, speed bumps and all, fire trucks and police and ambulances. Well, and that's, oh, my that's gosh. the main reason that yeah. they're the size they are, the size they are, because it's been engineered that that size least affects like a fire truck responding to a fire because of the way they'll clear it before the second <coughs> kind of come through the first bump before the second tires hit it. So, um, I mean, that's the why they're the size they are. Now, the one, the one speed table that probably will be replaced next year will be the one on Sang, because more than likely Sang, one section of Sang from Cleveland to Whittington will be overlaid next year. That was the first one we did. We tried to do it with asphalt. It's worked effectively, but it's, flat. it's not as good. So when we will mill that out, take it away, repave it, and then come back and cut the street and put a concrete one back in. Okay. I have people asking about that. So final question. Yes. About policy, current policy. Uh, some of these apartment complexes, <coughs> neighborhoods, I guess, in some cases, some of them, are allowed to have private streets, and they build them to their specs and make them the way they want to. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered when nearly two years ago when the stop sign was stolen, probably went to the student's apartment room, like they all do, disappeared. Anyhow, it took about three months for the apartment owners to get out there and replace the stop sign. The police only manage traffic inside if they follow a violator in there and then can't stop them before they get inside. And they're, if they're called in there for some bad happening, they will run. But they don't control that. And in response, I noticed the Hill Place next to us now has two or three speed bumps that they put in. And they're a pair of little hard things. And when you go over, you will slow down. Very unpleasant. You know, there's sunset woods is and some of these others that are that are their own they're not public streets. Yeah. They're right. and this is <coughs> it's a drawback. There's for, good and bad. Yeah. It's a drawback. Mm -hmm. It's a good it's a 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 Street. Well, it's one reason I was not supportive of the the Hossel project because that's what they're gonna. That's what that will be. Is if they put houses in there in a road, it will be. There's no telling what kind of road they're moving in. They don't have to do anything to Hossel. So it's so those are it's just we have to weigh those things. <laughs> Keep that in mind. I want to thank Terry for coming. Thank you. And if you want to have more questions, you can contact one of us or get with Terry directly. Give him one. Thanks, Terry. Uh, all right. So Lee is going to share with us the the proposed neighborhood plan that that is coming up and that will be on the council's agenda. I'm exciting for one mm -hmm. more copies of this. If anybody wants a hard copy. If you don't have the ability to print it out at home or want to look at it here, I did make a bunch because it's about eight or ten pages long. But I've got some maps. You've got some too. too. But well, if you I've, want I've this got some maps. View at home or um, the maps are going to be very good. Does anybody else need a copy of what's going on? You don't want me to print anything, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Lee Folson, uh, Sustainability with the City. Um, we adopted City Plan 2020-2021. 
25 in 2006, recently updated it to City Plan 2030 in 2011. One of the action items out of City Plan that we address every other year is we do a complete neighborhood plan. And so previous complete neighborhood plans include the downtown master plan that we did in 2004 with Dover Cole, um, the Walker Park neighborhood plan that we did, the Fayette Junction neighborhood plan that we did in 2009. Um, and what a complete neighborhood plan is, is there's a, we, we define an area, we research it, look at it, um, create um, a document and an illustrative map at the end. Um, but we look at all the, all the things within that boundary and, the, and even outside that boundary, um, traffic patterns and counts, infrastructure, constraints and opportunities, the demographic consensus data that we can get, environmental impacts, um, we compile all that into reports, graphics, maps um, that we can analyze comparatively during the development of the plan. We do a public participation process, what we call a charrette, where we invite everybody, um, the public, to come and we, and we walk through a design exercise on, on the property that falls within the boundary. Um, that's kind of our public input process. Um, out of that, we create a vision document, which is the analysis and then any recommendations or um, applicable implementation steps. These in the past have included tools like um, rezoning or creating design guidelines or amending the master street plan to better um, illustrate or um, um, uh, implement those recommendations. And then finally, we do an illustrative map which is uh, depicts the idealized build out of the area um, and so those are kind of the the products that come out of it for this year and, and when we do this we always look at about four different areas of the city um, and then we kind of recommend one to the city council to um, get their blessing before we move forward so this year we looked at um, the Joyce Avenue area in the vicinity east of College Avenue and west of Crossover Road. So this would be like up where the post office is, where Lindsay, uh, Lindsay's apart, uh, uh, home office is, P&G. Um, so we looked at that area. We looked at the Colt Square area um, and the surrounding neighborhoods. That's basically College to Township to Gregg to North Street. Um, we looked at the neighborhoods directly to the north, to the west, and to the east of the University of Arkansas campus. This is um, what's being now called the, um, uh, or the area that the Town and Gown Committee is, is looking at for policy recommendations. And then the last one we looked at was the Weddington Drive corridor, which is west of I-540, going out to about 51st Street. The, the criteria when we when we look at these four and we start weighing them, um, um, we we look at the areas and we, and we kind of we try to determine um, how those areas fit in with the goals outlined in City Plan 2030. We're looking for areas that are experiencing significant development pressure. Um, we're looking for areas that have a high percentage of vacant or underutilized land, and we're looking for areas where we can find stakeholders and partners so that we can get um, significant public participation in the process. Um, and, and so then out of that, we develop kind of a list of opportunity and challenges that we see for each of those areas based upon that criteria. So for instance, Joyce Avenue <clears throat> has opportunities there to create a more complete street network. Um, the zoning is really disjointed up there. The challenges would be that the existing development that exists is kind of disjointed. Um, there's no real definitive development pattern. The street and sidewalk connectivity is very limited. Um, and it's a very commercial area, so we, we were unsure if we could get really good public participation to, um, to work with us to develop a plan for that area. Colt Square. Um, Great central location, so you've got easy access to most of your destinations. 
it's got a pretty good street, sidewalk, trail, bus system. Um, so you've got a lot of alternative transportation options. Um, a lot of that area though lies in the floodplain and it hasn't seen a lot of significant development pressure recently. The age of a lot of that is probably going to see some development pressure in the future. We thought this one would probably be a better one to put on the back burner and maybe revisit at some point in the future. The University Overlay District, um, that proposal, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the challenge with, challenges with that were mostly the physical size of the areas surrounding the U of A. It makes it difficult to propose a viable boundary. Um, because it, it's it's kind of pockets, and so you you have to do two or two or three. You couldn't. It, it wouldn't make sense to tie it all together to wrap the west and the north side of the university because the west side is very different in the topography and the existing um, build out of that neighborhood than to the north. And so you're you're looking for kind of geographical breaks to where you can define a neighborhood. Um, the other thing is that the implementation steps and the final products that come out of this process when we do this um, are very visual and we didn't feel that those products would be the, the best vehicle for addressing some of the concerns um, that have been um, vocalized by U of A neighbors recently. Um, while this was all going on, the formation of the town, uh, town and gown committee was just beginning and we felt that those significant policy discussions should occur within that group first um, before we did something where we're, where we're really looking at how is this going to develop, how is it going to fill in, and, and, and you're creating a visual, um, a visual document um, for that. So that leaves us with the recommendation, <clears throat> which is uh, Weddington Drive, the boundary that you see on your map about 350 acres. Um, we felt that this provided the greatest opportunity at this time um, because it, it works good with our goals, infill, um, uh, the, the area out there, you'll notice the subdivisions, uh, the single family residential subdivisions to the north and south of our boundary. You know, most of that stuff was built from 2000 to today. Um, typically, what happens is, you, is in the development of the city, the, the residential rooftops will develop, and then the commercial development will come in behind it. So the commercial development will follow the residential rooftops. What happened out there is we built all that housing 10 years ago, starting 10 or 15 years ago, and then the recession happened. So right at that point when that commercial development should have started happening, the bottom dropped out. And so everything was left pretty much vacant still. So you go down the wedding corridor and it's, it's open. But corridors like that will develop commercially. Um, a lot of that land out there is zoned actually agricultural. Um, but we know that that development pressure is coming because you've got all those people, all those residents living out there that have to drive to the other side of 540 to come into the core of the city to get their dry cleaning, to get a cup of coffee, you know, all those, all those things that you do on a daily basis. So we felt that this area is ripe to do a neighborhood plan, get ahead of that development so that we could better guide it. Um, because the unfortunate thing about commercial corridors is the development that we've seen in the last 30 or 40 years is not very um, attractive. And when I say that, I'm thinking of College Avenue, Martin Luther King. You've got a lot of curb cuts, you have issues of access, um, you have a lot of development that um, once it once it goes in, you're not going to reverse that for 30 or 40 or 50 years. So the idea is get in front of it, plan for it, plan what it's going to look like, plan how that transportation corridor is going to function, um, and and then 
create that vision and then when the development starts to come um, the city can say you know this is the plan for this area and yeah. we want you to develop in this manner um, so the development pressure was a big factor in Weddington we know it's going to happen we know that there's a lot of vacant land out there we know there's a lot of rooftops out there um, so can we get ahead of it can we plan for it and then what will that look like and so when we do the public charrette that's what we'll be asking what would you like this to look like when it develops would you like it to develop like North College Avenue or MLK or would you like it to develop in a more urban form with walkability transit bicycle lanes some of those um, things that make it more of a place and less of a a, a, a runway yeah a, a through a through uh, process so that's kind of where we are with it um, and this is this this is what we did for Walker Park neighborhood master plan so um, we create a, a vision document that um, creates guiding principles talks about the process talks about implementation um, a lot of maps a lot of um, demographics um, zoning maps future land use um, and then the the, uh, the end of it has the recommendations so like this is proposed sidewalks and streets when we did the Walker Park plan down around um, Walker Park and Jefferson School and so we looked at um, what are the streets that don't have any sidewalks you know so we can get them on the sidewalk program that Terry was talking about because um, we need those those sidewalk connections in that walkable neighborhood um, we did a total rezoning of this whole area and, and, and we rezoned it to zoning that was more appropriate for it the, the Walker Park area was zoned mostly um, multi-family 24 units an acre but it was built out totally as single family eight units an acre from the 1920s and 30s so there was a very it was it was you know there was um, those didn't match up we need to come back and get the zoning to better match what the neighbors in that area wanted to see and so out of that process um, if anybody's been down there recently there's a lot of single-family homes being built on vacant lots that were down there um, and so um, the, I think the, this plan helped guide the private development community to say okay well this is what the city wants the city wants infill and there are vacant lots down here and they want it to be compatible with the existing neighborhood and so they rezoned it um, and and we're seeing that happen now and, and those homes are selling well and that neighborhood is improving so um, that's kind of in a nutshell how the how the process works and what the end products are and then I can take any questions or comments or anything that anybody would like to uh, ask thank you what questions do you have for me or comments well if i may comment the, the uh, description of what's happening in walker park neighborhood is total totally ignores the watershed those guys that are building those houses some of them may be lead certified but in the discussions i've heard from those people spoke they see the main developers that are doing that stuff they're not even LEED certified and they're the opposite of low impact. They, they leave no trees, even though they have huge big trees. Uh, the neighborhood conservation uh, title is the opposite of conserving the neighborhood. You have no place to garden. The city is subsidizing community gardens and encouraging people. We've got organizations encouraging people to <coughs> garden, grow your own food but we're encouraging people to build houses and red dirt the lot so nothing will ever grow there except in some artificial bed. 
So I think that, I think it's, well, first of all, the, the zoning, the neighborhood conservation, is not speaking about conserving nature. No, it's, it's not. It's neighborhood That's conservation. Not. That zoning, that zoning, it was never intended to mean that, though. What I'm saying is neighborhood conservation zoning district was intended to match the development form that was down there. And so a zoning district was created that has the same density, single family, is what existed. It's not talking about environmental conservation. <coughs> the other thing is, this is a these um, these neighborhood plans. The implementation steps come from the people that that participate. And in that neighborhood plan, <coughs> there wasn't there wasn't you know people didn't want it to be vacant down there. They wanted those properties to be developed. And that's what came out of those meetings. And so that's what went into the implementation steps. I think what's happening down there meets to a T what the plan proposed. And I think that's import important. I, I, I agree and there's, we've, tr we've made progress, but there's still a lot of work to do in that area. But this, so a plan for like land, land use um, is a guide. Now, do we want to add language that that encourages um, conservation of the soils, conservation of the trees? I think that's a possibility, but it's also part of other parts of our code. But this is not this is not code. It's a guide. Then you have to come in and rezone. And zoning at this time does not link to watershed conservation. Now we have low impact development ordinance that people can use by choice, um, but I do, you know, there's the next step where that could be incentivized by a stormwater utility where you would get more, you get points or reduction in fees if you implemented low impact development. That's, but we don't have that in place yet. Uh, so there are other tools. The thing about a neighborhood plan is, it's exciting, is that you do get to be a part of visioning for what the, an area will look like. Um, and I, I, I agree that, that those are important things and it makes me feel sad too that if people are cutting down the trees down there or not doing the watershed conservation of it. The, the Walker Park neighborhood plan though talks specifically about land use, like what can be built there. And the plans at this time don't talk about how to build those. That's, that is part of the form-based code or um, the UDC, the Unified Development Code, which are two different things. And I'm only explaining this because of just the, how the system works currently. And we've made, at least I've worked hard to make a lot of changes in that up to this point, but there's still a lot of work to be done. I completely agree. Uh, and I'm not going to be on the council next time, but I certainly will be there advocating <laughs> for those changes. Uh, the thing about, so looking at the Weddington Corridor, I'm very excited about, uh, I was, I met with Leaf's team about this and, and I was very excited about the investment in this part of Fayetteville. That's what I'm excited to see, is the investment in time and building a charrette process for this part of Fayetteville that's carefully planned. This part of Fayetteville was built in kind of a boom time when things were, people were buying land and putting, in, putting things in. And, and it, there are some pockets of really neat areas, but it needs to be pulled together. And this is something that from the time when we were meeting with people on, in campaigning, we had talked about we need to build community areas in work for. And so this is very exciting to me that this is something that has come to fruition um, if it passes at the council. I, I am definitely going to support it. I also support uh, utilizing the town and gown committee to work towards the overlay. Because that was my first thing too, is thinking, oh, I wish we could do two at the same time. <laughs> but I do think it's smart to um, <coughs> utilize the town and gown committee first and see what's really needed, how should we delineate around the campus, uh, those kinds, that group needs to be involved in, and set up before that 
happens. Um, that's going to be a very important group, and I hope that you will apply to be <laughs> on that group. Uh, but this is a way to say, okay, in this area, we think that the zoning should be this way. Now, the what I heard Jeremy Pate talk about was the opportunity to get around, essentially, the fact that this is a state highway. The fact that you can plan this in such a way that you create a space off of the state, the state highway. So you create your community outside of the highway. The highway is doing its thing, but you could create a little frontage area or and then um, have traditional town form up against that and the, with the parallel parking and walkability went out with the highway in the middle and so that you're creating the space and kind of letting that highway do its thing and pulling pulling the community off of the highway so that it's not like a runway so it softens that I think that that I was glad I didn't thought of that but sure I've seen that when it was mentioned I thought of course that's what I've seen a lot of communities do they and the other thing I'm, I hope that people will get involved you have some really dense neighborhoods in here uh, and this is where the council of neighborhoods I think could get involved in saying bring your people we're having a charrette about this area and uh, so I guess I wanted to let I wanted to say that I was very pleased to see this and also very I, I like even I don't know there's one factor was the size and the amount of resources and staff but expanding I was glad to see it goes to 540 um, but even widening that 540 area a little bit would be something that would I, we want, I don't know if there's any possibility to change the no, boundaries. The, the, yeah, absolutely. The, the council, you, you all can change the boundaries. Really, I, what we found when we did the Fayette Junction plan is we, we took on more acreage than we could really accomplish because what happens is we do the public input process, the charrette process, on a Saturday morning, typically. And then by the following Thursday, we have created the illustrative master plan. We have drawn in the structures, we have drawn in the road system, we have drawn in whatever needs to be drawn in um, to this area. So we do it in a very short time frame. We do it in five days. Um, so we took on too much acreage with Fayette Junction 1 and we really ran us ragged to, to get it done. This one, that the Fayette Junction was 650 acres. We're looking at about 300, 325 right here. So to add a little bit more acreage wouldn't necessarily be a, <coughs> a huge deal. Some of this area closer to the interstate <coughs> has projects that have been approved but haven't been built or like the, the frontage lots in front of the neighborhood market. That's pretty much, I think we kind of know what's gonna happen on those. Um, and so that's why we kind of pulled that boundary up from that in front of where the where the Black Forest Drive is right there. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, mm -hmm. you all could add some acreage to this, and it would still we Doable. would still be able to. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to go up, what is that Steamboat Drive, and, and bring yeah, in some of that a... some of that stuff in there? Um, I think that would be. Would be doable. Okay, so you can expand it like north or and south. Yeah. There. Yeah. And east. Do we? Is there anything magical about <laughs> stopping at 540? Um, <laughs> it's just it's you know 540 is that Chinese, great Chinese wall. <laughs> you know, you, you got once you got one spot to go over it, yeah. and that's where it's at. It it kind of I mean it's it, it's just a natural break. You know the the east side of 540 is different than the west side of 540, I guess. Um, but that, yeah, there's something to think about. It can be seen as a, we, we, it might be really nice to see what we could do to, to do something to tie yeah. the yeah. city together and yeah. ignore that interstate a little bit for yeah. this there's process. A story on NPR about roads and how they divide. I don't know, did you hear that? Yeah. Well, I've heard the period. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, we could bring it on over. The, you know, the interstate highway system in the 1950s, when they went into the large cities, they literally put in the elevated highways and they, they cut neighborhoods in half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they cut everything about those neighborhoods in half. Um, it's just the nature of highways. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I do think that part of the conversation that we've been having on our board about the Overlake District um, is near 540 as yeah. well as right up against the university. So this might be a good way to bring people together to have some conversations about, I understand what you're saying about the yeah. Town and Gown Committee having a, a good voice in planning. But I was a little disappointed to see this because I was hoping that you all would choose that university area because of your yeah, the, planning you know, expertise the, and all, rather than just citizen input, which is very important, but yeah. your expertise in the process and it would be well, very I'm valuable. I think, I think this one just jumped at us because the zoning just doesn't really match good. You know, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those where they're, Developers are going to start coming through and they're going to start asking for C1 and C2 zoning, which is your typical suburban commercial zoning. Mm -hmm. We're starting we're starting to see it. Whereas when you look at the west side of the university, Markham Hill, mm -hmm. it's all zoned single family, four units an acre. Um, staff is probably not going to go in and propose that we change that zoning to anything denser or probably anything less dense. And so the tools that come out of these neighborhood plans don't really match mm -hmm. with the issues that are happening around the university. Um, I think the area to the north of the university would make a lot more sense for a project like this than the area west of the university. Um, it's just one of those things where they all they all really have their their pros and their cons. It's just as staff you've got it. This one we just feel that because of all the residential development that happened out there when the recession hit and the commercial development didn't have a chance to happen afterward, you know, when the recession hit, that it, it's when it, when the development turns back on, this corridor is going to be one of those that's going to be highly, you know, a lot of actions, a lot of zoning actions come out of this area. Yeah, we might <coughs> at the meeting if we could do google, uh, google earth map yeah. that would help i think if we even if we capture mm -hmm. just across I, I know there's some areas right in there the thing that we have to be careful of is this is the maranoni property and and do we tip into that because that's a lot more land or do we yeah do that, I, I, or wouldn't, it, I wouldn't recommend going east to i-540 because i just don't think that I don't think that it's. I don't. I don't think the contiguousness is there. I, th I think that 540 is a. It's a demarcation line. Right. Well, yeah. yeah the only thing to think about, I think, along those lines, is that so many university students live west of 540, and the bus routes are going, and the connectivity with trails and streets, and moving people yeah. from the university. That's where so many students and all live. And so I, I almost hate to see that line be the stopping, but we can, we can talk about it and get you something to say, JP. Well, no, I agree with it because uh, there is a sense from some people that live west of 540 that is somewhat separated from the rest of the city there, at that line, that 540 line, you know, so, so yeah, I, would, I agree with you. I, I'd like to see it pushed a little bit further Eastward there uh, to include that. Um, I, I only I think it'll only enhance that area and on further out, you know, uh, Wellington as well. So because the traffic out there is is, is kind of crazy right now. Anyway, uh, it seems like it's getting more and more every day. So you need to have you know take that into consideration. Okay. Question. Yeah. Uh, do I understand correctly that what's before the City Council at the next meeting is whether to approve the study, whether to approve the development of the plan? That's okay. and, the pro here. Mm -hmm. and the product of that effort will be a plan. Right. No zoning changes. And that just plan, plan will be submitted to the City Council mm -hmm. and, and then presumably blessed by the City Council. I mean, blessed or not blessed. Or not, right one or the other. Mm -hmm. And if it is blessed, then who has the ball for implementation? It, it falls back to planning. So in the Walker Park plan, um, in the Walker Park plan, these are some of the implementation steps. Okay, well I, I don't need to hear those because I'm talking process now. Yeah. 
Uh, so presumably, if I understand you correctly, uh, you guys will carry the ball and any further action by the city council required to implement, mm -hmm. you will bring before the city council. That's right. We typically set out goals in short term, medium and long term, mm -hmm. with short being you know, five years less, medium being five to ten, and long being fifteen to twenty or fifteen to twenty-five, and and then we put all that in a spreadsheet and we we follow up on it. And we start ticking off the short-term ones. We start working towards the medium-term ones, and so um, we're even now we're still doing implementation stuff for Walker Park and Fayette Junction. Okay. The downtown master plan we've got. A lot of that, most of that done, except some of the really long range okay. stuff. Thank you. I think I understand. Now I, I have a comment. This is this is point number two, unrelated to the questions I just asked, and you did answer them. Thank you. I made a career out of project work. And one of the things I learned in doing successful project work is you gotta clearly define the objective, which I think you've done. And you have to clearly define the scope and not let the scope of the project get out of hand. So I encourage you to take that into consideration when you ask for that boundary to be moved to the east of the bypass, because that significantly changes the scope of the project and makes it significantly more difficult for these guys to get done. Because that's a very good point. You start dealing with the interchange of the interstate at that point, which probably needs some work, but um, it it adds it adds to it. It, it would it would change how we would look at this. But doesn't it need to be considered um, in any big plan? Yes, it, it does. I mean, how can you do it without? It does. The, the the problem is I shouldn't say the problem. The <laughs> challenge is dealing with. The state highway department. Mm -hmm. um, it's a challenge dealing with them. And when you start talking about dealing with with interstate and interchanges, you have sure. you've I understand. gone ten times. Um, I think that's about to be useful to have. We need to look at the map. This doesn't show where some natural boundaries might be. And I, I agree that there's there may be a mapping medium where you're not getting out of scope because I do think. The focus here is this is not letting this become nowhere USA, and um, that's not the scope of this. This is this is residential. The scope this is commercial focus. So the I like the idea of kind of incorporating this, but I'm not supportive of. To me, that's a separate neighborhood plan. Like this, and maybe it's not the bound. Maybe 540 isn't the boundary, but I do think. There's a different objective here. I'm pointing to the map, <laughs> but there's um, it's there's a commercial. This is all a commercial focus with how do you tie in? And I like I completely agree. This is something I don't know if some of you were here. Julie McQuaid has was going to find ways. To, I was had to map this, and I was, I was I don't know if you've seen that, but she's put points of interest that tie together that, and try to to create or get rid of the perception of this boundary that we have in our community. And and I like that idea too, but I also don't want it to be, I don't want to lose the focus. Uh, I get just my pro the issue with the east side of High Quarry is the north side of Weddington is mostly developed there. And so it yeah. leaves you with Marinoni property. Mm -hmm. So unless we're going to design the whole Kit and caboodle on that piece of property. That's what I mean. It's like it would be difficult to, you know, because we usually will create this map along parcel lines. Mm -hmm. So we're not splitting somebody's property, right? Because then if you come back with a rezoning action, it doesn't work, right? And so you take it all or you don't take it at all. You know, you either put it all in the plan or you okay. or you leave Do it you out. Do you incorporate the master street plan mm -hmm. in the very beginning? Mm -hmm. So it's part of the charrette. So that's right. That has to be where those master where the master street plan is making some changes on the west on the east side of mm -hmm. I forty would need 
Would they yeah, have that we, you know, we would look at the okay. context. Okay. We're going to okay. look at the context, but for drawing the illustrative yeah. map, we're going to stay in the boundary. Um, whatever that yeah. boundary is that you all will determine, we're going to stay, you know, because that's what we're designing. But that when we look at the demographic information, we're going to look at everything on the west side. When we look at the master street plan, when we look at parks, proximity of parks, to, mm -hmm. you know, how do you get to the parks, how, you know, all those topography, environmental constraints, future land use, current zoning, will create a whole array of maps and data um, prior, uh, as part of our research prior to doing the public input process. And we'll have all that on the walls. I think the so green infrastructure yeah. plan is part of that. That's right. And, and so it, it's and it, protection and it shows so is the Yeah, streamside protection, mm -hmm. hillside, although we don't have any <coughs> hillside out here. Yeah. We don't have much floodplain in this, which, mm -hmm. you know, if you start removing some of those environmental constraints in it, in it makes it easier to work with. We do need a way to connect our enduring green network, which is that green hatch um, across that corridor. And we typically do that in trail corridors. Um, so that'll be a big component of this plan. You're talking trail corridor inside the green network. That's right. Is, is, is that this? Is that what you're calling Yeah, it? that hatch. Is the enduring green network is that the that game? that piece right there I think is actually uh, the park. This part, the dams, checkerboards. This is oh, the okay. right. question I have: What does enduring huh. green network mean? If that's the all that's in the diagonal, the checkerboard is what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. It is based on hmm. yeah, uh, Fayetteville Natural Heritage Association, along with um, who else was involved in that? There were number of partners so people, 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 people water people district people. Yeah. Um, they they did a study where they prioritized um, the quality of natural existing natural environment and they ran it through a model and came up with a map and um, so it incorporates a lot of your string corridors a lot of your wooded hillsides some of your highly valuable agricultural lands um, and it's meant as to um, to preserve those lands in an undeveloped or a, or a semi-developed state as natural areas um, provide alternative transportation corridors i.e trails through them so the public can get out there and enjoy those those natural lands and so um, when parks looks at acquisition for parkland They'll look at that map. When we look at trail corridors, we're always thinking about that. Um, as development happens, we're, you know, we, we look at that and try to save some of some of that. Um, so does that mean? A lot, I mean, I'm not familiar with that land. Does that mean a lot of that is forested now? I mean, are the trees there now? Or? There's different factors. Some of it is, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with karst. Oh. Karst topography means that there's mm -hmm. basically honeycomb under it, under us, and so there's, there's, I know that you are, <laughs> but um, some folks aren't. So there's some areas that are that are designated this way because they're a recharge area, or they may have, yeah, they may be forested, or they may have a, uh, some drainage areas in there. So it's, it's saying this is green infrastructure, meaning this helps take up water, it recharges the groundwater, it's. Uh, it gives others other services in this. So if there's, it's a, it's not designated land use. It's saying in the planning process, can try to consider these things when designated land use, um, in in designating the layout of a development that would go in, or and and planning staff that uses these kinds of tools to help guide where buildings would be set and so on. But Salem Road does already exists through there? Oh yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's, there are buildings in here. It's not that there's hey. not development, it's saying these are areas that you would try to leave more trees or work with the developers to do certain things, but there's no code, there's no guarantee. It's saying these are some issues in these areas. Yeah. <clears throat> Question. Mm -hmm. Asylum does not go all the way through to the north. Correct? 
think my right there's a, there's a, there's a and it will end up out. <laughs> and and on the master street plan, uh, where does that go? I mean, is it ever going to be connected all the way through? I mean, so you do have that connectivity back to Weddington. I mean, that to me is that's that's a real drawback to me in connecting a lot of the neighborhoods there on Salem, you know, and close to the to Holcomb and that would like to come through without going to, to Rupel and get to Weddington and go to the neighborhood market and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, all the areas over there, especially if this is, um, you know, there is going to be more connectivity and trails and that kind of thing. Um, and the build out along uh, Weddington is nicer and, you know, more not like College Avenue, let's say, um, or MLK, then, um, you know, pull more uh, from those areas over by Holcomb that can get through and, and you know, shop there and not be trying to go around, all the way around the other direction. And that's probably a question for, for Terry. And I think that, so this is what Jeremy was saying when I met with him. Um, I asked that similar question. It seems like there are, there are issues and, you know, outside of these red lines. Um, and he was saying that uh, that can be part of the discussion. So this okay. will plan the zoning recommendations and how different like types of buildings, but it can also be part of like an ultimate plan on where traffic will be flowing and how to move people. And he was he specifically talked about that stub out as something to think about in this planning. Um, part part of the difficulty there that I've come that I've heard is is the expense of expanding that road because of the need for the bridge oh. and where, where it's also the cuts bridge? through uh, in enduring green network with a stream oh. of riparian forest and all, oh. all the things so um and the trail goes through there so it's uh it's not that it won't ever go through there but it's it's just that's been part of the discussion is that if an expansion of that road will be more expensive than just a pretty little flat road going through. And it's primarily because of the bridge, the yeah. cost of installing the bridge. Okay. So it's Same with Rupal too, doesn't it? Yeah. Rupal doesn't yeah. go yeah. Yeah. all the way through either. Right? But it will, not now. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Yes. After, after this is um, adopted by the council, say, or, or not, mm -hmm. then couldn't the west side be done just like this and how, how what how many days does that take plan kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah what's the pro so yeah what's the next step because the city does these periodically we do these every two years and so two years from now we will do the same thing we'll look at probably some of the ones that didn't make it joyce cold square um there was one so there. yeah there's always the possibility that we can come back so it would be competing though with things east no, no, competing with, with other ways and all that. Oh, right. right. It would be yeah. So they look at different things. So potentially. Mm -hmm. So the public input tomorrow night at the meeting is an important part of this, right? I mean, not tomorrow night, next Tuesday night at City Council meeting because the council is going to vote to approve or not approve the recommendation of staff. And if there were there were a ton of people who showed up and wanted had good reasons that their mm -hmm. neighborhood should be considered, we'd be listening to that before we voted, right? You yeah. all haven't had. There's been no public input on this decision this is a staff yeah. decision right now to recommend this yeah. okay and, Terry, and that's just the process that may be what used. you're saying like is there, there hasn't been public mm -hmm. input yet on well I and mean, you know i thought well this passed i mean just immediately couldn't you begin but it doesn't sound like immediately you would necessarily begin on the on another side of the what, um, I, what I foresee so immediately is the is, town and gown committee is forming. <laughs> That's what I'm looking forward to is that town and gown committee to, to form and get going on some ideas for that area. Uh, there's another one I'd like to add to the list that we, would compete against is the South Fayetteville around the, this was discussed, and we there's a resolution we passed around the National Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Is that, was that considered? That wasn't considered. One of the things that we, as staff, we, we try to think about is where have, what wards have we done them in in the past? And we're trying to spread it out yeah. okay. amongst all the wards, sure. right? That's so good. the downtown master plan was all ward two, basically. Mm -hmm. Walker Park was all ward one. Mm -hmm. 
Bet Junction was kind of half Ward 1, half Ward 4, because Razorback splits the wards there. This is all Ward 4. The, the Joyce Avenue thing was kind of where I thought for Ward 3. Um, so, you know, but again, it's, it's all up to the City Council on, on, you know, where you all would like us to concentrate our efforts. Um, we try to, you know, come up with four options and, and really play the opportunity and the constraints against each other, you know, in our internal discussions um, to try to come up with what we think is the best plan given the current state of development, what's yeah. happening in those various areas, the pressure that we see. That's terrific. Okay. Yes, it, it seems to me we might be missing an opportunity to do something west of 540 if we don't do it now because like the boom and then mm -hmm. we didn't do anything but we didn't go far enough this time maybe that's a good point this one if we have to compete with other parts of town it's a good point and then morty's did you have your hand up no okay yeah. beverly has <laughs> the, uh, I, I was just going to say maybe there are um maybe it doesn't have to be either or um, and maybe there is another uh, avenue to to consider you know terry's suggesting in, in a different context maybe it doesn't have to be um, a neighborhood mm -hmm. charrette plan um, as was done with walker park i mean there there may be another um, forum avenue um, for discussing issues west of 540 that doesn't have to be the same process um, that this east of 540 east, east, east of 540 that this process doesn't necessarily have to be um utilized mm -hmm. for that and it's it's not necessarily i think an either or that there's a winner and a loser that one side you know gets attention and the other is this neglected is, yes i and completely agree and that's my point with the town and gown committee right. i feel like right. that council members going forward when that town committee town and gown committee gets going there's a huge lever there to do to do something and get input and take it to the council well, there you are, have a plan that's your commit that's your public hearing process there are circumstances uh, in, you know, in cities from time to time and the, the capital overlay district, for example, and, you know, in, in Little Rock, I mean, there may be unique circumstances from time to time that would prompt, um, uh, you know, a specific targeted area for uh, consideration in, in a different process. And this process would be great for that but it's not exclusive i think it, at all yeah I and so good. i mm -hmm. i think you know to that terry um, you know raises a good point I, I don't want us to think that because we need to do work here and um and which i certainly think needs to be done on I mean, this this yes um, you know as much as we drive mm -hmm. out there and and shop out there and um where our daughter lives out there, it, it needs a lot of attention. So I, I would hate to see us, um, you know, lose opportunities where there are other avenues, you know, to, to take up issues while they are ripe and we don't want to lose an opportunity. But, you know, that, that nobody, it doesn't have to be that one neighborhood is, is neglected or another one that has not gotten enough attention um, has to wait too. So I, that would be my hope is that we can um, have it all. Very well <laughs> said. Right. Right. Well, and I think I'm just sort of sensitive to the, the, the thought ever since I was elected of I-540 being this division of the city. And I think the way you explain that is real. It is there. It does exist. But it doesn't mean that we're not working to, yeah. to connect to, to everyone, to each other, and the communities together. So that, that was, I liked the way you said that. And since the Town and Gown Committee has been mentioned several times, I'm going to pass this around if anybody wants to, this is third quarter vacancies or could do on August 24th. Okay, hold on. Are there any final questions or for leave? Oh, the line here is not the leave. Uh, <laughs> over the years, every time a plan is discussed and, and something similar to this or, or PCD, it comes up to, and you said it tonight, 
have a dry cleaner. Now I see one man in this room that's probably wearing a uniform that requires dry cleaning. And I bet we're all wearing jeans or something that we wash and dry, even hang out on the clothesline. So is there a demand for dry cleaning these days like that from outside the Oh, I don't know. I just use that like I use coffee shop. You know what I'm saying? It's it's really it's your daily needs. It's something that you're doing yeah. once a week, twice a week, right? Something that maybe you would walk to if if you had if it was close enough, you had the ability. It's kind of just a generic term. I and I think that's yeah, those kinds of things, the mixed use, you don't have to drive so far. You could, ideally, you could walk to those. Well, the answer to Aubrey's uh, question is yes, there is a need because <laughs> we have to drive, you know, all the way into town on 71 or down to MLK to the closest uh, dry cleaners, unless there's one there that I've just totally overlooked. I don't so. think there's one out there. No. That's something else that we'll look at is we'll look at all the businesses that exist out there and we'll kind of inventory <laughs> what's there and kind of look at what those folks that live out there are driving across the bridge yeah. to get to town, you know, that maybe if they had it close to them, they wouldn't have to get in their car to do that. So. Well, thank you very much, Lee. Uh -huh. Let's give them a round of applause. Can you reuse these if they don't want to take them back? Yes, okay. I can reuse so them. I don't know that, but if there may I will be other things. Okay. for those. All right. Can be reused. Ready for announcements? You want to talk about that? something else on yours? Yes. You want to talk well, I just want to pass this around in case anyone is interested in the vacancies on the boards and commissions. That the deadline is coming up August 24th at 5 p.m. Um, is the deadline for applying for those vacancies that are on the list that I just passed out for those who are interested in the application taking as well. Is oh, this online. is the right the, uh, the application is online yeah. too, and that's just. I just wanted to encourage Ward 4 and friends um, to apply for positions on, on city boards and commissions. Very important, and it's we usually have a great turnout of people who apply, and uh, the more the better. It's really, really great. You're on the nominating I'm on the nominating committee, and really is, I think, important to have some people who have lots of interest in those different things it's really tough when you don't we don't have anybody to put on it and that board has to meet and they they're short so we need people to apply along those same lines the so that's august the 24th is a deadline for that um the mayor's town hall is august 20th i y'all probably see announcement about that it's going to be at Bartlesville trail at seven o'clock encourage everyone who wishes to that's one that's really in word three but we're all encouraged to go there and then the ward four town hall in the fall in september will probably be at the university so we're not all university not all in ward four we're trying to find a place there but i think that's there. the university one there's yeah. five town halls there are five total uh, one all ones on campus and then there are others that are and there are four others so so yeah thanks for telling about that to get, to get the students you know to that town hall meeting. <laughs> you have any other announcements? I want one more. The Environmental Action Committee um, is talking about the resource management plan that will be forwarded to the council for discussion. And this is all about recycling. And this is very, very important to get involved in this discussion because um, with the plan will rec make a recommendation to the staff on how to move forward and that means that includes how to buy equipment and that means types of trucks this gets into the millions of dollars worth of trucks and equipment to buy if the if the recommendation is one way or another and um, it also has to do with uh, maintaining our our commodity streams that we sell um, whether they're clean or not so clean and um, maintaining buyers and and also um, how to get more, how to increase diversion while also maintaining our uh, commodity supply to maintain uh, uh, confidence in the buyers that buy our commodities. And when I say commodities, I'm talking about the glass, the plastic, the paper that people buy from, uh, from the city. So this is an important plan. Staff has worked very hard on, on the draft. And when, when is that? It's uh, the 8th, I believe it's Thursday. The Water and Sewer Committee? No, 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 the EAC, Environmental Oh, Committee. okay. Oh, that's right. You guys are still talking. 
So we're going to, uh, that'll be the last time that that group talks about it. And so if you're interested in that, that's at 5.30 on the 8th. Is the 8th a Thursday? Yes. Wednesday is the 1st. Okay, so, thank yeah. you. So the 8th of it is the Thursday. So the, uh, and then also um, on the council's agenda is the, the discussion about petition the petitioning um, for the city of Fayetteville there was in, the in 1970 there was a portion there was a, a, a little piece of the ordinance uh, some language that articulates that if there's a petition of a certain number of people in the neighborhood that uh, that that causes uh, there need to be a need to have a two-thirds majority which is a super majority on the council uh, and this it was um, pointed out by uh, some citizens, and this is being, um, uh, Kit Williams, our city attorney, has said, said that, well, first of all, didn't realize it's there, and in looking at it, um, is saying that it is counter state law, essentially. Um, so we will be discussing that on whether or not to, or what to do about that. <laughs> and um, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion because, um, it's really about it's really about in some ways you know what what a property owner can do with their property and then how much of the majority of the of the council can make a decision based on that most of the time um, rezonings are, are are requested by a property owner um, the applicant tends to own the property so the the request for rezoning um, what this says is and I don't know what would have happened in 1970 the um, you know, I don't know the background of the story. I mean, they said they, I don't know what the story is, but at that time they um, incorporated this this rule, but it, it's never been, in the time I've been on the council, it's never I don't think it's ever discussed. been. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever been and, used um, or enforced. So it's an interesting discussion, and I hope, and if you're, if you're interested, come speak Qu up. Question. Yep. What are the options before the city council? But that's what's difficult, because it's a, you have, if it's not in line with state law, then I don't know how we could do it, right? So, but, the, but to me, the bigger question is, I certainly don't want it to be perceived as petitioning isn't important. So petitioning is still very important, and you've heard it, to, I think, tonight mentioned twice how it affected different things within the planning, like presenting and changing and shifting on, on where things are proposed by staff. Uh, but the council, apparently, uh, the number of votes based on state law is set uh, by state law. So I think that there's not a lot of option at this like point. looks like a pretty cut and <laughs> dry issue. But um, I, I wonder if the other option would be, uh, I don't know that sometimes it's not either or, if there's something we can look at for uh, like a resolution that the staff takes into consideration the petition or making sure, this is what I brought up at the last council meeting is making sure that it gets in the packet, that it gets, you know, some making sure it's part of the discussion. And so this will be my questions is not necessarily no, but are we, do we have a way to make sure that it's incorporated? So, um. Well, I want to comment on the basis of 12 years of attendance at these Ward 4 meetings. I feel that we've been well represented by our various aldermen both in Ward 4 and on the entire city council. And they've been responsive to a large extent to the expressed concerns of the people. And I personally don't see the need for this <laughs> illegal <laughs> ordinance. One thing too I think is important is sometimes, I know there are, throughout my time on the council is I've received petitions which are very important and then I, I hear the, the opposite from people that didn't want to do the petition, but they're, but they're quiet and they don't want people to know that they oppose the, the petition. And, and so that, that's, it's, to me it's also important to recognize that people don't all sign petitions. They may also think of the, the opposing view, but they're sometimes shy to say that out loud. And so they'll contact us quietly. This happens a lot. <laughs> yes. And um, so it's just part of that. I, I feel like I need to say something about yeah. this. Um, I don't think this has anything to do with the, the petition that um, that was presented in regard to Project Cleveland. This is about adjacent property owners. This is only involves people within 300 mm -hmm. feet 
of a piece of property that is um, has to be right around asked the for uh, to be rezoned. It would uh, that that only applies to a few property owners that would be within that very small area that would make any difference. Um, it would it it doesn't really matter if if two thirds of a particular area. Um, was for or against something that was proposed for rezoning the only people that had that that that, that would pertain to is people mm -hmm. just within 300 feet that's all that's what the um, so that would be the, um, that uh, the origin of which is that mm -hmm. that's the basis of zoning laws is that it's it's you know that that 20 percent protest is a pretty common provision and um and in a lot of states um it's not unusual at all uh, when, when there is uh, a protest, but again, we're only talking about a very few property owners that would be would fall within that very narrow range. But the history of it has to do with those people adjoined just directly adjacent to who would be impacted, you know, most of all. But as far as somebody down the street or across the way, no. That that's this wouldn't um, give anybody the the put them in any position to stop a rezoning. Mm -hmm. But the history of it has to do with just the connectivity of the the yeah. property immediately abutting and right adjacent. But um, that that's just I mean just to make sure the issue these two issues are not confused. Um, I, I don't think anybody said that. Um, I'm not aware that that Kit or anybody else has said that that was issued. I mean, raised by the people who signed petitions um, with regard to any particular project. It was pointed out to him by citizen, citizens recently, and that's all that, right. that he that he mentioned to me. The thing that that we have, the thing that reminds me of that is we have used petitions for like street calming like that kind of thing is like adjacent property owners and they have to sign them they all have to sign it's 100% I know it's 75% had to sign the petition for it to be approved or something so for a traffic coming but I think that's calming. a city policy that's, yeah. a, that's a policy that's, that's policy. it's not yeah. it's not a vote land kind of thing but it reminded, it reminded me of that so it'll yeah it's hard to in those kind of situations to if it's not a legal part of the code, then I don't want to do it. I don't want it to be perceived that petitioning is not important. It's very useful. So. Yes? Before you close, I think we should uh, say a few words of applause and applaud Brew Gallagher for all of you. She has recorded this meeting and made sure it was edited well to share old government chat. That was that was 17 years, right, of working for the city, and there's going to be a little party for you yes. uh, that you know about, right? Uh, can I say that? <laughs> gavel for gavel, he makes no Thank you. Thank you very much. Jay, would like to yes. say something in the yes. close? Yes. Uh, the Federal Council of Neighborhood is going to be sponsoring a mayoral forum uh, on September the 27th during our regular meeting. It's at 6.30 upstairs in the City Council Chambers. And it will be, it start, did I say 6.30? It starts at 6.30. Everybody's welcome. It's going to be televised. Prue, will you come back and televise it for us? <laughs> <laughs> um, so everybody's welcome to come. Thank you. Oh, and uh, one other thing has to do with kind of somewhat my line of work as well, that uh, AARP is sponsoring a um, meeting on Medicare at the Federal Public Library on the uh, 1st, which is Wednesday, right? Uh, it's at 1030 that morning. So uh, the, the title of it is, is you learn to say, so and talk about Medicare and Social Security issues and so forth. So I, I'm assuming there's going to be the group from Little Rock that will be up here holding that meeting. They're also going to be sponsoring another meeting on uh, family caregiver uh, workshop at the Schumer, Schumer Care Center for Seniors. Is that in Springdale? The meeting? Uh, yes, thank you. I really messed that name up. Sorry. Uh, and that is um, August the 21st and 22nd. Uh, yes, and that is free. And it didn't, they didn't say exactly when that was going to start. But, but two meetings of AARP. They've been having a lot of meetings recently, a lot of 
uh, conference calls and so forth, and I'm usually on those uh, calls as well. But if you know of anybody that's interested in either one of those topics, you might want to pass that on. And then the mayoral uh, candidate uh, as well. I think it's just going to be, at first we talked about having the uh, those individuals that are running for the city council uh, speak as well, but I think uh, the final analysis we thought with the time that we had, it was just going to be primarily on the mayor of race. What kind of duration are you thinking of here? Start at 6.30? Well, we have the room from 6.30 to 8, so uh -huh. it may or may not go that long. Uh, we're developing the questions at this point in time. To okay, so an hour and a half max. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then one thing I would like to ask is when would this group like to have um, the city council or four candidates come to this meeting? We could do August, we could do September, we could do October. <laughs> Whoops. So our next meeting is August 27th. Do you want to do earlier? August 27th, August meeting? When was filing closed? It's done. No, filing just over. Filing? September. Yeah, I think so. Okay, on October 29th. That's too late. Yeah, that's too late. So it really needs to be either September 24th or August 27th. September 24th. September 24th? When does filing close? I would say August 17th. 17th? Yes. No. Goodbye, or we're a candidate, I'd say August. As a voter, I'd say August too. But I'm not a voter for anymore. But well, I am a voter. But, <laughs> but that's that's. A, I'm, it's a, certainly. I, I'm going to be here both months. Are you September? <laughs> I will be here. Yes. What are you going to vote? August, September, August, September. 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 It's done. Decided. Okay. Good. Yeah. That's September. Okay. September twenty fourth. And what about our meeting time for Ward 4? I know that you had wish that, that we could talk about that. Yes, must have earlier. You want it earlier? Yes. Like six? And I did check on the parking situation, and I understand that we will not get parking tickets and we park out there yeah, it's over a little while before six. six. Okay. How, did, how do you all feel? Is six, six? Okay. Six. It gets staff here more tied to work and camera crews and. All right, so yeah. August will start 6 p.m. Yes, sir. I know one person that that's not good for, but that's all right. Is that you? That would be Mike Emery. Okay. Uh, he tries to come over here between the... 6.30? Uh, yeah, between the 6 o'clock show and the 10 o'clock show. So, uh, yeah. I'll just let him know. I'm going to make arrangements. See if it'll work. Uh, this is, I don't know how many years I've done it. Seven. We could try 6.30. No. Some of the people who have asked me about it said that all city meetings pretty much meet at 6. Right. Council Neighborhoods yeah. does it, City Council does, and that it's uh, confusing a little bit. But yeah, I hate for anybody to not. Last month when we talked about it, the kind of negative was parking. And so I checked on that, and um, I really can't be late to Fayetteville Council Neighborhoods anymore because you're not going to get a ticket for parking at 6 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I tried at 6. Let's try at 6. This will be starting next month. Starting Season August. Mm -hmm. and I'll put it on the Facebook page. Well, we need to tell the clerk. Tell clerk and and that we also need to find out if this room is available. Mm -hmm. I'll take care of that. Okay. Cool. I'll take care of contacting her and getting okay. it on there. Boy, the way you said that, uh, I I heard you say, "By golly, this room will be available." I'll take care of that. <laughs> There, there are no other regular meetings on the United States. Monday is a pretty good day to do it. Uh, I also brought uh, this if anybody wants to take it with them or they may have already received it. It goes out via electronic copy as well, but it's the Fayetteville newsletter, uh, Fayetteville Forward, kinds of staple things going on. So you're welcome to take Great. that. And if you're not receiving it, let me know. I'll get you connected. Okay? Who puts it up? Uh, the city. Uh, Julie McQuaid who uh, yep. works on it. So it has just different things like energy challenge uh, taking place and the local food guide and transportation improvements taking place so what Terry presented is described in here uh, there's uh, Fayetteville Parks and Recreation different time like events taking place and camps so it's a really good summary of what's going on in town 
good thing to give to your neighbors. It doesn't say how to be a good neighbor. It says, hey, this is what's going on. <laughs> so, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a really good discussion. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Thank you, Prue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.